Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast, Fungal Detective, how the Minion has helped solve an outbreak in a UK intensive care unit. With no further delays, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr Joe Rhodes from Imperial College London. Joe is a bioinformatician and a molecular epidemiologist who's working with clinical scientists in the Royal Brompton Hospital. She's exploring the use of genomics for diagnostics and survey of fungal infectious disease. We are looking forward to hearing how Minion has helped her with moving her project forwards. Thank you, Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Rhodes. I'm an early career research fellow at Imperial College London in the Department of Infectious Disease. And I use the Minion to help solve an outbreak of a fungal infection in a UK intensive care unit last year. And my presentation is just going to be discussing how that happened and how it came about. Um, just a basic overview um, of where fungi are, because I appreciate not everyone has a biology background or an interest in fungi, but this is the tree of life. And this is basically uses phylogenetics to look at how things um, are related to each other and how things have, have, have evolved over time. And you see from first life, right in the middle, you have bacteria coming out and bacteria are known to cause some pretty nasty diseases like tuberculosis, Legionnaire's disease, Salmonella. Um, and then you have other things like archaea bacteria and then you have this super kingdom called eukaryotes and that includes all things like um, sea life, crustaceans, uh, mammals, uh, amphibians, birds, plants and also fungi. You'll notice that viruses aren't on the tree of life so these cause diseases like HIV, Ebola and Zika and the reason they're not on there is because technically they're not alive and there is no one protein that is shared by all viruses in order to um, trace how they've evolved so they're not included. We're really interested in fungi um, and this is the kingdom fun fungi and this includes uh, the mushrooms that you eat or find on trees and decaying matter and also the moulds that you find on food that's been left sitting for a little bit too long and also yeasts as well. So these will be things that are used to make your beer, for instance. Um, fungi can cause diseases, though, um, and you may not have, you may not have think you've heard of any fungal diseases, but actually you probably have and not aware of it. So one of the most prominent fungal diseases over the past couple of years has been ash dieback, and this has been heavily covered in the media, and there's been quite a good community effort to try and spot signs of ash dieback throughout the country since it landed in South East England a few years ago, and it's now spread throughout the United Kingdom. Other diseases you might have heard of are um, a type of rust um, that infects um, the cacao tree, which affects chocolate production, um, and also uh, a fungus that infects banana plants, which delays the harvest and affects yield as well. Um, fungal infections can also um, have a devastating effect on wildlife as well. So there's a fungus that kills frogs in um, Europe and Africa, and this has decimated populations in the French Alps. So fungal outbreaks have actually been increasing over the recent years. Um, for instance, the frog fungus I just mentioned, there's been a fungus that um, has decimated bat populations in North America. Um, this is called white nose syndrome, and it's this fungus that grows on the, grows on the nose of the bats. Um, ash dieback, um, a fungus that infects wheat plants, so ultimately affects the crop production. And then eventually you have fungal infections that infect um, humans as well. And we think that these outbreaks are increasing in number because of climate change. So fungi like um, temperatures between 13, 40 degrees typically. So if the world is warming up, then their range can expand. But also as human beings, we're traveling more than ever before. And we are potentially carrying that fungi with us when we travel or we're distributing it when we trade, when we buy things, or in the exotic pet trade, for instance. Um, antimicrobial resistance includes both antibiotic resistance, so antibiotics are used to treat bacteria, but also antifungal resistance as well, so drugs that are used to treat fungal infections. And it's thought that um, by the year 2050, there'll be nearly 5 million deaths in Asia alone due to antimicrobial resistance. So this is a big problem that we're facing. And the reason that fungal infections are so hard to treat 
is that they are eukaryotes and we are eukaryotes, so our cells are quite similar. But fungi have one thing that makes them different to us and that is a cell wall. And drugs target certain components of the cell wall or um, its synthesis or its function. You can also get drugs that target um, nucleic acid synthesis, so basically how DNA is formed. But the main class of drugs is called um, azoles and these target the synthesis of ergosterol, which is a component of the cell wall. And these are basically the, the first line drugs that are given when someone goes into hospital with a fungal infection. But they're also um, a main component of fungicides when um, farmers spray their crops with, um, with, with fungicides as well. So drug resistance can evolve in multiple places and the, uh, it's similar to antibiotic resistance in that uh, it's been used more in multiple places so drug resistance can develop more quickly. So it's important to kind of try and get an idea of the life cycle of a fungi in order to get an idea of how someone can be infected with a fungus. So the bit that I've, I've, I've highlighted here is the sporangia. So you've got your, your bread um, it's gone mouldy and it just, sometimes it goes a bit fluffy and it's those, th those fluffy structures that um, are called the sporangia and these sporangia contain thousands if not millions of spores so if you imagine a dandelion that's gone to seed out in the wild um, and the, the breeze distributes those seeds and they settle and grow elsewhere this is a similar sort of thing the spores get dispersed so imagine that your, your bread is actually soil out in your garden um, and, and these spores can enter the atmosphere and disperse and grow elsewhere. So um, humans are thought to inhale up to six fungal spores a day and in healthy human beings the immune system can easily take care of those spores. Um, white blood cells come along and engulf the spores by phagocytosis and then kill the spores. But if you're if your immune system is compromised in any way, so for instance if you've got HIV AIDS or um, you've had an organ transplant so you're receiving immunosuppressive drugs, um, or if your immune system perhaps is overreacting so you've got an autoimmune disease, then your immune system can't cope with the, the spores as well. And then you have um, essentially uh, byproducts of the fungi causing disease and then over, you have over one million deaths a year globally as a result of fungal infections. The difference um, here is that there's a certain type of fungus um, called candida, which is a yeast, and they don't produce spores, but instead they can enter the bloodstream and cause something called candidemia. And this is what we faced last year when a new fungal infection made the headlines in the UK. And um, although it was new to uh, the newspapers, it was actually discovered back in 2009 in Japan and has since caused sporadic cases um, moving west in South Korea, India and Pakistan, South, um, South um, Africa and then the UK. And it's, the first case in the UK was found in April 2015 and we started working on it about a year later. And what was really troubling was that um, it was causing the world's largest outbreak of fungal infection of this kind at the time. And it was actually quite drug resistant as well. So all of the isolates that were tested were 100% drug resistant to a drug called fluconazole of the class azoles, which I mentioned earlier. And there was varying levels of resistance to two other drugs, itraconazole and voriconazole. What was really troubling was that there was also resistance to a drug called posiconazole, and that resistance hadn't been seen before. So what we were seeing was multi-drug resistance, um, which was really worrying and a real problem. Okay, so we were approached to see whether we could use whole genome sequencing um, as a way to do a genetic epidemiology approach to tackle this outbreak. And the reason um, for using whole genome sequencing is because obviously it gives us a lot of information and it can help identify the species, it can help identify where it came from geographically um, and identify a source and it can identify drug resistance mutations as well. But we need to do this really rapidly. Um, and there are other platforms such as Illumina, which are quite capable of doing all of these things, but um, because of the, the time involved and the expense, it would have meant actually sending um, the data, the, the, the DNA off to be sequenced at a, 
a sequencing facility, which meant entering a queue, which meant that we probably wouldn't have had the data back for uh, about four, four or five weeks maybe. And we really needed that data really rapidly. So that's when we started leaning towards using MinIron. And what ultimately led us to using MinIron was um, the fact that uh, this is a new species that hadn't been sequenced before. So we actually had no idea what the genome looked like. So we had no idea what the drug resistance mutations were, where no other isolates had been sequenced, so we couldn't compare to find a geographical origin. Um, so we basically needed to do genome assembly. So to do this, a genome assembly is kind of like uh, the most difficult jigsaw puzzle in the world. So if you imagine having a newspaper, which is your your DNA copies of the genome, and then shredding it up, and then you need to stick those shredded pieces of paper back together. And that is kind of the analogy for assembling a genome. Now, if you were to go off and do a luminous sequencing and have, uh, you know, 250 base pairs maybe, that's 250 characters long. Each of those shredded pieces are 250 characters long, and then you've got to stick them together. It will take ages to do that compared to using the long reads, the min iron, which could potentially be anything up to 20,000 base pairs long. Um, so that would take a, a less time to stick it back together and get your newspaper back again. So we generated our gold standard reference via genome assembly. And then that meant that we could sequence other isolates and basically map those back to our reference genome that we've created. And that speeds things up um, a lot then. So we did that and we compared the isolates from the outbreak to each other and, um, and, and generated this phylogenetic tree which basically looks at how things have evolved over time. And we can, we, what happened here was that there were multiple introductions over time um, from a single source and that a new drug resistance developed during this outbreak as well, this posoconazole resistance. But not all of the isolates contain this posoconazole resistance, which is really interesting. During um, the course of this project, we got in touch with um, people at the Centers for Disease Control, who had also been doing some sequencing of candida isolates from different parts of the world. So they'd sequenced isolates from Japan, so that was the original 2009 isolate. They'd also sequenced isolates from South Africa and um, Venezuela, India and Pakistan. So we combined all of our sequences and um, compared them to see if we could find a geographical origin for the UK outbreak. And the UK isolates were really similar phylogenetically to isolates from India and Pakistan. So at this point, you're, you, you think that maybe you can influence hospital policy to see if there are any healthcare workers who've recently been to India or Pakistan to see um, whether they've potentially acted as a carrier. So they won't have the disease themselves, but they could have it on their skin. And then if they're treating patients, they could inadvertently transfer that to their patients. Obviously, there's nothing malicious going on. It's just an accident. And then the, all of the patients that are in hospital are in there for a different reason, whether that's um, they're, they're real with a different infection or they're in there for, a, for an operation. They're all already in there for something other than candida and they've acquired the candida infection in hospital. So, for instance, the doctors can then use this information to guide their note taking when they're asking patients about their recent history. Have they been to India? Of, have they actually been the one to bring it into hospital? What we actually saw was that um, new cases started popping up on a different floor in the hospital and being as all these patients are in intensive care, they're not going to be getting up and walking around. It then um, places the focus on healthcare workers. The genetic data that was provided by the sequencing actually allowed us to look at the drug resistance mutations as well. And what we saw was that all of the UK isolates had this drug resistance mutation that caused an amino acid change and it caused this tyrosine to phenylalanine, this Y132F. And that mutation was also seen predominantly in the Indian isolates, which confirms our um, idea of it being um, from India. Um, other mutations are seen elsewhere in the world. What was really interesting was that the Y132F 
um, F mutation was also seen in Venezuela, but the Venezuelan isolates are not related to the UK isolates, so there's been a simultaneous emergence of this drug resistance mutation. After looking, after discovering these drug resistance mutations, we wanted to see if we could use the min iron for something more than just genome sequencing and whether it could be used as a diagnostic. Um, and so we've already created our assembly, we've already created our goal reference, we've um, done the phylogenetics and found a, a geographical origin and we found these drug resistance mutations. But what if we could sequence isolates in a patient and pull out these drug resistance mutations really quickly and then we know um, what drugs to give to that patient, kind of like a personalised drug regime per patient. And so this is really a proof of concept and we actually found the resistance mutation responsible for this um, tyrosine phenylalanine shift within the first 24 hours of sequencing using the R9.4 chemistry and we couldn't do that before in the R7 chemistry so the advances that have been made in the chemistry with the min iron have now allowed um, the min iron to turn not just into a sequencer but also a diagnostic tool as well. Um, acknowledgements, um, Imperial College Fungal Group, uh, Matt Fisher, Darius, Silker and Ali, people at Public Health England and Centres for Disease Control in Atlanta and also Nick Lerman and Josh Quick at University of Birmingham for initial help with setting up the um, design of the project and obviously Ox and Danapur because they've been a great help with getting this project off the ground and helping solve the outbreak. Thank you Jo. With all the news items about antibiotic resistance, it's good to know that your work is helping us understand the extent of drug resistance in fungal infections and bringing them into focus. Before we get started with the questions, just a reminder, Ask Your Question is waiting for you to post your question. And with that, I will hand over to Jo to answer them. Thank you. Okay, uh, first question. Uh, on a similar theme from the work you've seen in the field, what are your thoughts on the speed of change in antifungal resistance? Um, my thoughts are that it's quite positive. Um, so similar to how antibiotic resistance has been pushed to the forefront of people's awareness, antifungal resistance has also been pushed to the forefront as well. And there are pharmaceutical companies working to develop not only new antibiotic drugs but also new antifungal drugs as well. So um, yeah, I think that the speed of change is quite positive. Next question, how important is it to monitor resistant profile changes over time? It's really important um, because these bugs essentially can just develop resistance really quickly and um, the new resistance profiles can make them resistant to new drugs and also um, new, new drugs that are being developed all the time. So a really good example is the class of echinocandins, which are different to azole drugs. Um, and they were approved for use uh, back in 2015, I believe, and we're starting to see a little bit of resistance coming through. So um, monitoring resistant profiles means that we're, we're kind of one step ahead of the game. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of attention to antibiotic resistance. How does antifungal resistance issue compare considering we treat crops, etc., with antifungals? Yeah, so it compares very well. So. Uh, in terms of antibiotic use in agriculture, what happens is that a lot of cattle get treated with antibiotics, obviously to keep them well as, uh, as, as well. Um, but in terms of antifungal use, what happens is that the crops are actually sprayed with um, fungicides that contain the same class of antifungals that are used to treat people with fungal infections. So. What happens is that there's fungi that are naturally occurring in the soil and um, they have sort of a head start on what these antifungal drugs look like and they can develop resistance in the environment. 
and then if um, a human happens to be infected by a spore from the, the progeny of that environmental fungi, then um, they generally get infected with um, an already resistant bug. So it's very comparable to the antibiotic resistance problem. Okay. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about limited new antibiotics. How much focus is there on antifungals in pharma? Uh, yeah, so there's definitely a lot of focus. Um, there's starting to be quite a few spin-off companies from unis that are focusing completely on antifungals. And they're, and that they're generating some really good results. Um, what the issue is, is that unlike, unlike antibiotics, as I mentioned in my talk, antifungals, because fungi are so similar to our cells, um, what might work in sort of an assay to see whether it kills the fungi, it might also kill uh, human cells as well. So they've kind of got double the problem, as it were. But there is this push in pharmaceutical companies to develop antifungals and there are things being tested and going through human trials as we speak. <clears throat> um, how are the clinical research systems that you worked with different from those that you've seen with collaborators in other countries, e.g. the US? So in the US we've seen people tackle similar issues um, um, when, especially in terms of candida, when they needed to generate a reference genome because it hasn't been seen before, and they've used other systems like PacBio, which obviously generate long reads as well. But they are then facing the problem of the turnaround time not being quick enough. Um, so the beauty of the MinIon was that it was really rapid, um, and that's that's why we went for the MinIon. You reduce the time to resort to 24 hours, which is great, but maybe insufficient for some infections, e.g. sepsis. How would you envision speeding up the bedside diagnosis using minion? Uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, I agree, that might be insufficient for sepsis, because obviously you need to move quickly for that. Um, I mean, for fungi, it would be great to reduce it to under 24 hours, but the genome is so large that um, 24 hours was, was kind of the best case scenario at that point in time um, and in trying to get a read that covered what we wanted. So a way to speed up would be to basically target just known genes that um, uh, have these resistance mutations in or um, say if you wanted to just um, do it in terms of identification um, just known genes that help target identification, so perhaps like exon seq or things like that, which would greatly speed it up. Um, that obviously limits you to you have to know what genes you want to target. So it's yeah, it's a bit of give and take, but that would definitely speed it up. To use minion in diagnostics and human disease, we need rapid turnaround. Um, what is the time frame from culturing the candidate to identifying antifungal disease? antifungal resistance determination, sorry. Uh, actually really short, I mean I, I spent quite a long time trying to get the turnaround time down as much as possible because time is of the essence. So normally if we didn't have to worry about time you could culture the candida um, over three days maybe and then do a DNA extract um, using a really cheap kit that would take perhaps you know two days maybe and then do the library prep um, but because this was so important to get done quickly what I did was just grew up the candida in quite big vats so I, I basically bulk up the cells um, by a lot and then I can just basically pull them and spin them down and basically get a high concentration really quickly so therefore the culturing is only 24 hours and then um, there's a DNA extraction method that um, I altered quite extensively to try and get the extraction method down to just a couple of hours as well. Um, so all in all, I managed to get that down to 24 hours-ish compared to what we were looking at before. You didn't look at potential economic benefits to the NHS in your study, but if you were going to do the study again and collecting health economic data, what would you look for? Um, so what would I look for? I would look at uh, 
what the patients are in hospital for. Um, so all of the patients are in ICU for a reason. So some are in for organ transplant, some are in because they'd had another infection. Um, and what is the cost of the medication, the healthcare that they've received, what is the cost of them actually uh, being in that bed? Because that, that bed, it's estimates you, you spend about a £1,000 per person per bed per week in the NHS. And that's in a hospital outside of London, I think, so I think it's probably more in London. So it'd be things like that, um, things in terms of uh, perhaps like cost of people's time, like healthcare professionals as well, because you we got obviously people uh, treating those patients. So it'd be things like that versus how much the minion actually costs to run. So what are the savings that the minion is actually letting us make? Okay. Question that has come in, so uh, I'll hand back to, to Jo. Uh, so this question just come in, asks, what programme did you use to build the golden references? Do you observe any bias on minion, such as base composition preference? Thanks. Um, so I used spades for this, um, doing a hybrid assembly. Um, there are other um, assemblers that you can use as well, um, such as Mini ASM as well, that also performs really well. And did I observe any bias on MinIron? Uh, no, is the answer. I, I, I didn't actually, no. So, yeah, hope that answers the question. Okay, and we have one more. I think oh, brilliant, okay. It's just coming through. One more. Okay, according to your opinion, which could be the best strategy to construct the library from a non-model eukaryotic organism in order to use the minion device? In fact, do you think that minion could be useful in those cases? Yes, minion could be useful in these cases. Um, I mean, if you if you think about it, Candida auris is not a model eukaryotic pathogen. It's relatively new in terms of um, you know what we've seen. Uh, so the best strategy to construct the library. Um, in order to use an amino and device would be to just use the um, the library prep protocol, the the library companion that's provided by Minion. Um, don't you? I didn't use anything um, fancy. I just used the the, the basic library prep um, and just went through the Covaris shearing um, and just basically everything that Minion uh, recommended. Uh, so yeah. It can be useful in these cases. In fact, it's it's probably the best thing to use because it's so rapid and you get data so quickly. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. And with with that last question, we will close the session to, for today. Thank you very much for joining us all, and we see you at the next webinar.